I'm uh, Stephen Stone, S-T-E-P-H-E-N and S-T-O-H-N. I'm an entertainment lawyer here in Toronto, Canada, and also uh, a television producer um, and uh, a little bit of a record producer as well. My life changed dramatically. In September of 1964, I saw my very first ever music concert. And it was at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto. And I'll, I'll take 30 seconds to describe it. The, in those days, you didn't have huge equipment, so you had a whole bunch of opening acts, little local bands who'd play like two songs and then get off, and then somebody else would come on. Then this group called Shadows of the Night came on, sang a hit, and the house lights went you know, back uh, half up, as they had been all the way through, and we were waiting for the main act to come on, and nothing seemed to be happening, and I thought, oh, well, their equipment is still up there, so I guess they'll, they'll perform another couple of songs. Then all of a sudden, all the lights went out. It was pitch black, and a single spotlight hit the Shadows of the Night drum kit. A roadie raced up, ripped the front of the drum kit off to reveal the Beatles, and then it was pandemonium for the next 90 minutes. And I, it was my very first experience as a concert, and I knew at that moment I was going to be in the entertainment world, I was going to be in the music world, Whatever it took, I, this was the world I wanted to be in. So I started writing songs, became a member of a, you know, rock bands. We played in local high schools. Uh, when I got out of university, started to work with some friends. We made a couple of uh, low-budget feature films. And a friend and I wrote some songs that ended up actually getting into the top ten in Canada and just drove all my way along. And then uh, our lawyer kept saying to me, go to law school, young man. And I kept saying not on your life, and I guess being a man of my word, I ended up going to law school. <laughs> and um, after I graduated from law school, the same lawyer who'd helped me all the way through and I'd worked uh, at the law firm said, uh, okay, now you've got to go an article at one of the big law firms so that you get a really good experience. And I said, nope, never going to work in a big law firm because, you know, they'll suck the blood out of you and, you'll, you know, I want to be with the people. Anyway, I ended up uh, being a partner for 10 years at McCarthy Tatro, which is the hugest law firm in Canada, like 900 lawyers. So once again, I'm, I just am a man of my word, I guess. I mean, when I was going through law school, everyone knew because I worked uh, producing these feature films and had some songs that were on the charts at the time, everybody knew I was going to be an entertainment lawyer. Uh, so it was actually odd because in those days, um, I used to go to law school dressed in a suit and tie, and I was the only one in a suit and tie, and they thought I was crazy, particularly in third year, I took the business planning cluster, which was like advanced tax, super advanced tax, securities law, advanced corporate law, all the big kind of corporate things that you'd take if you were doing three trillion dollar pipeline deals or things like that. And what are you doing that, that Stephen? You're going to be an entertainment lawyer. I said, exactly. It's all the same kind of thinking that I want to get into. And, uh, and sure enough, you know, I got out and those skills really have been uh, very, very useful. Generally speaking, Canadian law is pretty similar to the U.S. I mean, we live right beside each other and it's uh, the, you know, the common law system that we grew up in. But in the copyright area, we've followed the British copyright law and America has, has its own copyright law that has been built up in a different way over time. Canada has remained out of step of uh, a lot of the advances in copyright law for the past few years and in some crucial areas really has lagged behind the rest of the world. So that's been a concern and I and many others here have been working as hard as we can to get the copyright laws reformed in Canada. Uh, but it's just been a very slow and sometimes frustrating uh, purpose. Anything to do with the internet, uh, they, the Canadian copyright law really started in the early 1900s and has not been uh, worked on very much since then. There have been some amendments, but not large-scale amendments. And so we've been very far behind some of the international treaties, the World Intellectual Property Organization, the WIPO treaties, which have tried to set some minimum standards for things like digital rights management and technological protection measures that are very useful and integral to getting our products out over the internet, just have not yet been implemented in Canada. And as a result, the Canadian society, and it actually quite shocks me, 
to see the figures of uh, illegal downloading in Canada compared to even the United States, where we seem to be four times as likely to engage in internet uh, illegal downloading, and certainly compared to Europe, where over in Germany, you know, it's amazing the amount of legal music downloading that takes place. People really starting to pay, uh, and almost at the same rate as they're doing the illegal downloading. Whereas in Canada, it's a tiny fraction. We're one of the worst countries in the world, and yet we look upon ourselves as being these wonderful, decent people who respect each other. Uh, you know, more than any, we're peacekeepers, and yet here we are being scofflaw freeloaders. Our term now is uh, shorter than the U.S. The U.S. used to be a fixed term, as you know, uh, of number of years. Now it's moved to the life plus 70 years. Canada's still at life plus 50 years. Which is, which is odd. It's one of the things you have to worry about. In the old days, it was the reverse. You could have something that was in the public domain in the United States, and you'd think, oh, I can use this. You'd bring it into Canada, and all of a sudden, it was covered by copyright. It's now more possible that in the reverse, you could have something that's in the public domain in Canada, because the author died, say, uh, you know, like 60 years ago. But in the United States, it's still covered by copyright. Uh, because I'd had some experience and had some songs uh, in the top ten here in Canada, there was a little bit of credibility in the community. But it was, it was slow at first, but then I got my first uh, small record company as a client. And uh, when a group that they had got their first gold record and then their first gold record in the States, I wasn't experienced enough then to handle the kind of negotiations with the U.S. record company. So, but I was very good at saying, fine client, for free, uh, I'm still going to help uh, quarterback this, but we're going to hire a really good lawyer down in the States, and uh, I'll work alongside that person to negotiate the deal. Well, you do that a few times, and you really start to learn the ins and outs of it. Uh, in a way almost better than you could ever learn at school. And in those days, they didn't have entertainment law courses the way they do uh, these days. So um, I gradually, I learned more, and then your reputation starts to grow. And then just one day, you know, one day you wake up thinking, oh, you know, I'm just this little uh, entertainment lawyer that nobody knows. And then a few days later, you wake up and say, hmm, my years have gone by, and that lawyer's gone off wait a minute, I'm one of the three uh, best-known lawyers here in Toronto, and it just sort of grows from there. All along, but even before going to law school, I'd worked uh, in the film community. And as a lawyer, I was not just a music lawyer. Uh, I actually met my wife for the first time uh, 26 years ago. She came into my office and wanted to buy the rights to a, a little book that she wanted to make a little her very first short film on. And I gave her, it was one of the best... Uh, uh, pieces of advice I ever gave, clearly, because first of all, I did it for free. I said, listen, if we get lawyers involved in this, the other side is going to think, the price is going to be driven up, they'll hire a lawyer, it'll become a really big deal. So you can do it yourself, I won't charge you. Here's a form, just go and buy the rights, we'll, I'll help you fill it out, you go over and negotiate it yourself and just pay them some money and you'll get the rights, which she did. I didn't see her again for a few years. But that little film turned into a, uh, something that has become quite iconic in Canada. Uh, she did a few other films after that and uh, licensed them for small amounts of money to the CBC, our uh, uh, public broadcaster here. And they became known as the Kids of Degrassi Street because she shot them on Degrassi. They then ordered a show called Degrassi Junior High and I came back into the picture because we were doing some public offerings to help pay for these shows. Uh, and then Degrassi High, which uh, was shown on PBS in the States in about 100 countries around the world. And now, uh, about 10 years ago, I left the large law firm because we wanted to buy, uh, you can't see in this uh, camera view here, uh, we're in a 100,000 square foot uh, warehouse that has four television studios and a back lot in it that my wife and I have built. And we produce a show called Degrassi The Next Generation, which is a carry-on. So really for 25 years, we've been doing in one way or another, and I've been a involved as a lawyer and over the past 10 years as a producer, uh, working with my wife, um, producing this, this television show which appeals to teens around the world and, uh, well, just keeps us young. Uh, we've developed, and this was a couple of years ago, uh, this uh, dramatic series, Instant Star, which uh, looks at the life of a young uh, singer-songwriter who wins one of these contests like an American Idol. But what happens to her life after that? And it was interesting, the idea came, uh, my wife and I were sitting at the taping of Canadian Idol, which is the Canadian version of American Idol, 
because uh, I was working as the lawyer for the uh, competitors on it. And uh, she turned to me and said, do these kids know what will happen if they actually win this thing? And of course, we had a view of that because uh, I, as a lawyer, working with uh, young artists and uh, my wife uh, and I, working with the Degrassi kids who were in our TV series, were ve very well aware of what can happen when you start to develop a level of, uh, of fame. Uh, and he said, you know, that would be an interesting TV series. So we uh, turned it into a TV series, and this was where my love of music really uh, helped. Uh, we bring in songwriters from across country, very well-known songwriters, working in a music camp to create original music for the uh, show. We put out an album uh, each year uh, the, featuring the music from the show. And in fact, the star, Alex Johnson, has just signed an enormous deal with Capitol Records uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, we've got other people that we're grooming through the show, and we hope they sign enormous uh, record deals as well. And it's now sold in 120 countries around the world, and in uh, the United States on one of the MTV channels called The Inn. Uh, it's the number two show, has been for a couple of years, number one being Degrassi, the other show that we produce. So we sort of say, hey, it's way up in the dial, but it's in 50 million households. We, you know, isn't that cool? Well, I'll talk about the music camp uh, because, and in fact, we just completed one last week. We do a couple of them each year, uh, bring in um, between nine and 12 writers, organize them. They go to um, the same location. We, we hire some rooms, some soundproof rooms in one of the colleges here, and they work, go three in a room all day, and it's sort of like uh, the Brill Building, I guess, was in the old days. That's how I like to think of it anyway. But one thing we're very careful about is uh, working with them to figure out the best combinations of, uh, of writers. Uh, so rather than just throwing, you know, three people pulled out of a hat in together to be writing, uh, we're very, you know, aware of, well, let's take, th this person's a really good track uh, guy. This other person's really good in lyrics. This one has a strength in melody. Uh, an arrangement. So let's put those three together and they can write and on top of that and they seem to find it incredibly fun and very rewarding. Um, two things. One, we don't take any rights. I mean apart from the right to put it in the show we, we get the right to use the song there, but they own the songs. We don't take any publishing interests in the songs, which most television producers become the publishers of the songs. And to me, it's like, no, no, we can't pay very much, but we can give you your freedom. If one of these songs becomes a monster hit, good for you. We're going to benefit because we'll have a monster hit in the show. And it helps to give them the incentive to, uh, to create great songs. So that's one aspect of it, the more business side. But the other side is that we sit down with them for a few hours before the, right at the beginning of the week, and say, okay, these confidentially are the storylines that we're exploring this year. You know, the lead character is becoming a little more mature in her writing this year. She's doing her third album now, so she's rebelling against uh, some of the earlier work that she did. She wants to have her, she's torn between wanting to have a commercial success and at the same time wanting to write meaningful songs. And of course we draw on the experiences that we have all had through the years. Some of these, you know, it becomes life imitates art, imitates life imitates art. and. They also feed back to the script writers their own experiences, uh, which gives a reality to the show. And as they write the songs, actually the songs start to help inform how the scripts are written, and the scripts help inform how the songs are written. So it's a uh, it's pretty cool uh, synergistic process. This synergy in the songwriting camp is something that actually is, was foreign to me at the beginning. Um, I, as a songwriter in the early days, had been very used to spending a lot of time alone. And a lot of songwriters, of course, do spend a lot of time alone, working on a melody over and over again. Uh, and then coming in and then maybe talking with a collaborator, having some, and then going back and working each, you know, maybe one is working on the lyrics or one is working on the melody or, you know, they're mixing it up. Uh, that was the, the kind of writing that I'd been used to that could take months to create a song. And that obviously works and has its place. Here, these, uh, these songs are being written very quickly. 
And so it's, it's, uh, you really need, uh, you know, if somebody is sort of flagging or not hitting it, somebody able to come in and sort of pull it along. And then the energy amongst the three of them in the room just propels it forward. I'm stunned by the quality of the writing that comes out at the end of the day. And I do think back to those old, you know, what must have been like in the Brill Building when you had, you know, Carol King and Jerry Goffin and Neil Sedaka and just so many others that, uh, you know, are just household names now. Basically doing that same thing, clocking in in the morning and coming out with a song at the end of the day, it amazes me how they were able to do it. And I sort of see a little bit of that in the camp that, uh, camps that we run. Very much, oddly enough, um, I love melody. And you would think that a lawyer is good with words and so it would be the lyric side. Any lyrics I write actually tend out to be pretty banal. Uh, so I will write a melody um, coming up with essentially dummy lyrics that are just stream of consciousness, just looking at the sound of the words, uh, connecting with the melody. For me, I feel most comfortable going over and over again, making small variations in the melody. And I figure if I can do it over and over again and still stand to listen to myself or to listen to the tapes uh, and still be interested in the song, then maybe it has the chance of lasting longer than, than just a few seconds. And then working with a collaborator, and generally I've worked with my old friend Christopher Ward, um, and he's, you know, years and years ago we wrote songs together. He's wonderful on the lyric side, and he's involved in the songwriting camp and helps uh, organize the songwriting camps that we do. So then, then presenting what is there, having input, and then going back and, and rewriting. And that has been my process till today. I'm not into the speed writing uh, uh, side that the songwriting camp is. Oh, absolutely that there is, uh, there is a point to uh, sort of establishing a routine and whether you feel creative or not, just going at it. Because you can never tell when that one magic chord progression against a melody is going to happen. And it could happen on the day that you're hung over feeling horrible and the last thing in the world you want to be doing is writing. And you know, you hope you've got your little recorder in some way going at that time so you don't forget that moment. Um, but yes, it's, um, and using other tricks. Uh, you know, I believe a lot in the, the sort of the writing process of you know, each morning trying to, first of all, I meditate every morning. Secondly, uh, try and just do some stream of consciousness entering into a journal that just what's on my mind. And it's really programming yourself to just get what's inside of you out in a non-judgmental kind of way so that when you do start to do whatever it is you do, whether it's writing or drafting contracts or negotiating deals or coming up with new television programs, that there's no internal sort of control that's happening there. You're, you're trying to just get what's inside out of you in, in as honest a way as possible. It is a, a really interesting microcosm here in Canada where um, there's been a conscious decision by our society that um, the arts, and by that I mean you know music and television and other arts, deserve a strong measure of support. And the reason is not the, re the same reason that you would give support to a, you know, a nascent shoe industry or something where you want to help them with a leg up until they become, can stand on their own two feet. It's a situation in which living right next door to the United States where um, cultural copyright products can be produced, a television produce, uh, show can be produced for say $10 million and licensed into Canada a tiny fraction of the cost at $100,000. So how can a Canadian television show that you're going to have to produce for at least a million dollars an hour to have any kind of uh, quality to it, how can that compete with a show that only costs the network $100,000? And the same is true in the music side. When, when the music already exists in the States with an enormous market and budget, it can in effect just come into Canada at almost zero marginal cost because it's already been created. And that's one of the wonderful things about intellectual property is once you've created it, the cost of creating additional copies is virtually nothing. So Canada, sitting in the shadow of the United States, faces this uh, dilemma. It's wonderful to have the benefit of all this American uh, culture that can just overflow at a fraction of the production cost that we just couldn't afford to produce on our own. On the other hand, if we do want to be telling our own stories and creating our own uh, musicians and and television producers, we, we need to be giving them 
uh, a leg up. And it's not just a leg up until they know what they're doing. It's a permanent leg up to uh, redress the market imbalance. What in other industries would be called anti-dumping or anti-competitive behavior is perfectly the norm in the copyright industries. So we have grown up in a culture here in Canada where there is support, and the support comes in a number of ways, including on our radio and television airwaves, uh, a minimum level of Canadian content has to be on the air. So radio stations typically play 35% Canadian content. Well, that's a great boost if you're a Canadian artist. And you can look at it in two ways. You can say, oh, it's protectionist. But at the same time, the 65% that isn't Canadian is the best of the rest of the world. And the television shows that come in, we get the best of America. And then, uh, but of course, we've got a, you know, a good pride of place for our local uh, television programming. That's the key difference in our industry here compared to the United States. We live in the shadow of the US, so it's, it's much more difficult to compete. Uh, at the same time, we've got this, the society has this nurturing view that we should be supported in, in a number of ways, like Canadian content and through some subsidization. As a result, in the music industry, uh, Canada has produced pro rata, a really amazing number of top line musical acts and has a quite vibrant uh, level of, you know, acts that are not necessarily known in the rest of the world, but are very well known in Canada and, and can make a uh, not just a living, but can thrive, uh, which is uh, quite energizing. What I find uh, doing a number of different things, as you've mentioned, whether you know being a songwriter, uh, being a lawyer, being a television producer, working with the record company, um, you can say, oh, he's just really good at multitasking, which is true, and I enjoy it, and I'm energized by it. What it really means is that I'm touching base with some, and have trust in, some very, very creative, bright people. The other lawyers in the firm are just wonderful. I, I love talking with them. I enjoy interacting with them. The people uh, here today were at the television studio around here are some of the top minds in Canada in television production. Uh, working with the songwriters, when we've got some of the best songwriters in Canada working in the songwriting camp. And so I'm not working with each one 24 hours in the day or 100% of the time. I'm touching base, giving whatever my interaction can help do, whether it's energize them or problem solve a particular thing, and then move on. There's an awful lot of delegating in my life, but the, it's not delegating sounds like it's something that I'm doing. There's an awful lot of me being energized by just these wondrous people that I get to work with all day long. Who could be luckier? I think the hardest thing that anyone can do is trying to figure out what it is deep down inside they want for themselves. It, we could, it sounds so easy to say, okay, I'm gonna write down what I'd like to be doing in six months time or five years time. And yeah, I'd like to be making $10 million a year, I'd like to have my cover on Rolling Stone, whatever it is. But the moment you start doing it, you start going deeper and you start saying, well, yeah, I'd like my cover on Rolling Stone, but also I want to be healthy. You start to realize, hey, it doesn't help if I got my cover there because I just died. <laughs> um, and yes, I'd like lots of money, but I also don't want to be uh, sort of hounded and I don't want my children being kidnapped. And, and when you start to go, and I'd like to be respected by the people around me and I want to have a loving relationship. And uh, I think anybody who can go through the exercise of truly trying to figure out what it is they want out of life in all aspects, you know, social, physical, as well as their career, uh, it's time incredibly worth spending. And it's amazing the number of people and the number of people I've talked to who've done that. And that's actually been the guy that has then moved them on and they've achieved exactly. And they thought, oh, writing down that high figure, uh, you know, that I want to make each year or whatever, achieving this seemed impossible at the time. Well, now I'm writing higher goals because I've achieved it. Our minds and bodies are amazing if we just give them a chance.